There's a big risk to biodiversity. There's a lot of different animals that live in this habitat. It's an amazingly diverse place and just, just incredible creatures. Anemones with eight foot long tentacles and you know, really cool uh, fishes with uh, eyes that don't actually have any lenses in them. And you know, just incredible little worms that actually look like squids swimming around uh, on the seafloor. Uh, an incredible diversity that could potentially be lost. So the resource, this is a manganese nodule right here, manganese or polymetallic metallic nodule. It's got lots of iron and manganese in it, but then it's also got that cobalt and nickel and copper, all those metals that we need for industrial society and for batteries. And this is what they're after. It's uh, basically a rock-like structure that has formed over millions of years and they're just lying on the seafloor in certain areas of the deep sea. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Drazen, a professor in the oceanography department here at UH Manoa. I've been at UH for about 18 years now, and I've been working in the deep sea for a little over 25 years now. The research that we were doing at sea is really critical because this is how we create a baseline for the ecosystem. The places that most of the companies want to mine have barely been visited by scientists or haven't ever been visited by scientists at all. There's a lot of the ocean that is in that situation. We haven't studied a huge amount of the open ocean, particularly where miners would like to mine. So going there and actually surveying these ecosystems, starting to learn who lives there and what the dynamics are, do they, things change with seasons, do they change between years, are they, you know, continuous across large tracks or do they vary, you know, um, with different currents and things of that nature. We need to know that because if mining does start, there will be some impacts and we need to know when we see changes in a community, if they come from mining or if it's just part of natural processes. We were surveying the very fragile organisms that live in the water column. You can drag a net through the water and you can catch lots of fish, but if you catch a jelly, it just gets squished out of the back of the net. So you've got to use some other approach. And the video that you were seeing came from a remotely operated vehicle, basically a robot that we can drive through the water column. It has cameras on it and we can survey all those more fragile animals. And so the video that you were looking at showed you an amazing diversity of jellyfish and siphonophores and, uh, and a variety of other you know, amazing animals that aren't so easily captured in nets. My name is Victoria Saad. I am a PhD student in the Biological Oceanography Department, and I work under Dr. Jeff Drazen. So you are in the Deep Sea Fish Ecology Lab, so we study basically not just fish here, anything really having to do with deep sea ecosystems. So from community composition to trophic ecology to impacts of deep sea mining or fisheries, that all happens here. I am studying the impacts of deep sea mining on mesopelagic communities, which basically means the organisms that live in the midwater environment. So right below where the sunlight starts to disappear, that's where my critters live. And they're small fish, squid, cephalopods, and I'm trying to see how mining might impact these communities. So part of my work is I get to go on a boat and I get to collect these organisms. So the deep sea is pretty far removed from us in terms of physical barriers, which means that a lot of what we have to do is capture organisms to figure out what lives there. And by looking at all these critters and these jars, I can go ahead and I can see what lives in this environment in order to understand how that environment may be impacted. So all these came from the Clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone which is an area that's south of Hawaii and kind of west a little bit. It's about 10 degrees north of the equator. This diagram you're seeing basically kind of the potential way that they plan on mining. So you've got your collector vehicle at the bottom, you've got this riser pipe, the bow, and then you have the pipe that goes down into the midwater. So this is kind of the proposed way of releasing the water and sediment in the ecosystem. But in addition, we kind of have all the ecosystem services that this region provides. You've got commercial fisheries, you know, your tuna, your marlin, things that you like to eat and your poke bowls are feeding on the critters that are right down below. So 
this diagram is meant to illustrate kind of where this plume would potentially go and all of the potential effects that it could have on this really essential community. One study that's just recently come out that I was not involved in has suggested that if just uh, a handful of mining operations were to begin in the clarion clipperton zone, the main manganese nodule mining area between Hawaii and Central America, that basically that whole region's noise levels would be above background levels because noise travels a very long ways underwater. So there's the potential to, to basically change the, the whole background noise environment over a very, very large region of the ocean. My research focuses on the impact of human activities on marine mammals and particularly the impact of underwater sound on these animals. My name is Ode Pacini and I am a researcher at the Marine Mammal Research Program at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And today we are at Moku'oloe, which is uh, where the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology is located in Kareue Bay. A wide variety of research being conducted at the Institute from the microbial community to coral uh, biology, fish ecology and coral reef ecology and biology and physiology as well as uh, some shark research um, and a lot of outreach and education uh, work is being conducted here. Noise pollution um, is an introduced sound that is going to disrupt either your physiology and your biology or your behavior. Noise pollution can come from all sorts of activities that um, we human create. We call them anthropogenic activities. And it can be from shipping lanes, it can be from fisheries, uh, military activities, oil exploration and drilling, renewable energies. We talk a lot about offshore wind now or deep sea mining. Depending on the severity of the noise pollution, it can just interfere with your communication and you'll tend to adapt behaviorally, you'll uh, produce a louder sound if you're well, for instance, so you'll shift the frequency or the pitch of your sound. And if the sound becomes too loud, it can be disruptive where you'll stop feeding or you leave an area or even worse, it can cause some sort of injury to your hearing uh, mechanisms. We hypothesize that just the mining is gonna create a lot of underwater noise and the noise is gonna come from the extraction of the nodules as well as bringing those nodules back to us. A lot of the things that dolphins and whales eat are going to be impacted by this as well. So it's not only going to impact communication and being able to potentially like find your pod, for instance, and also the things that they're eating are at really high risk, and so their food might be gone. So when the mining vehicle drives across the seafloor, it will destroy everything that it drives over, and it will be taking up the nodules, which are, of course, habitat for a lot of different organisms, deep sea corals, sponges. We found that uh, the octopi that live there actually lay their eggs on the nodules or on corals that live on the nodules. There's a host of organisms that rely on those nodules as habitat. So all of that is destroyed where the mining has occurred. And the mud underneath has been compacted, which affects all the worms and the little crustaceans that live in the mud itself. So it's incredibly destructive right in the footprint of mining. One of the things that is a big debate right now is that they're gonna kick up a huge cloud of mud. It is, after all, fine mud. And down in the deep ocean, currents aren't very fast, and so those clouds will, will form out from the collector vehicle, and they may cause mud to sort of slowly settle all around the collector vehicle, and there's debates about how far that's gonna go. The anglerfish that, that I showed you in the lab is you know, a phenomenal animal. It looks like a floating head with a little lighted lure on its forehead. Great little animal that you see in the movie Finding Nemo. And this animal relies on that little light on its forehead to attract its food. It sits there, it waits for some unsuspecting fish to come along, thinking that light is another member of its population or something else of interest. And then when it gets too close, it eats it. The problem is that light from its little lure isn't gonna penetrate through muddy seawater or the distance over which it can be seen it's gonna drop a lot. You can't see through muddy seawater. So this is gonna be very detrimental to the livelihood of this little anglerfish. There's so little information about how this is all gonna play out. For the offshore deep sea mining, I think we might not see the consequences right away. It might take a while, but it might have an impact on the um, 
midwater column and the ecosystem there that might have repercussions on um, coastal environments down the line. I think that if deep sea mining were to move forward and if they were to move forward, for example, with the midwater dewatering plume, which is the biggest risk in terms of the communities, the fish that we eat, eating on their communities, essentially. If their food source starts to go away, their populations are going to drop, which basically means that those coastal communities that really rely on fish aren't going to have any, or they're going to have far less than what they did before, and they might have to move towards finding other sources of protein. Their local economies may have a little hitch in the way there, just because part of what they're making their money on isn't going to be there anymore. And then there's a lot of cultures that like have traditional means of fishing, and they might see their populations decrease, and that could pose a risk to those cultures and those traditions as well, if it's not happening anymore, essentially. The main concern for humans is having their food sources and sources of survival in terms of the economy. We might see those be highly affected and potentially their populations decline and they start to appear less and less. The animals that live in those midwaters often are the food supply for things like tunas, swordfish, opa, and if it's disturbed, there's the possibility that we are going to affect the food source for all those animals we like to eat. We're also talking about mining of metals. Some of those metals will get dissolved. And when those metals are dissolved and they enter that water column, they may enter those food webs. And that has the potential to toxify our seafood supply. We don't know whether these things will happen or at what scale they will happen. Um, we just don't have enough research yet, but those are potential risks. And we do very much know on the seafloor that it is quite possible that some species would go extinct because the area they're talking about mining is huge, about a million and a half square kilometers. So that's an area equivalent in size. If you were to superimpose all the claim areas over the continental U.S., it would cover about 80 percent of it. It would stretch from California to Pennsylvania. There is a call even from scientists to slow down the pace uh, at which deep sea mining regulations are, are, are progressing because there is a feeling that there is not enough knowledge to make really informed management decisions about you know, what are the thresholds you set for environmental harm? How do you truly assess biodiversity loss if you don't actually know what the biodiversity there is yet? You know, things of, things, questions like that, we, we don't have a lot of data. So there is a call from some scientists also to slow down mining, but really it's a societal decision that needs to be made as to whether deep sea mining moves forward or not.